Welcome to PESED, People Empowering Seniors Independence and Dignity. And today we're going to be talking about living with less in New York. And with us today, I have Amy Schoenfeld, the expert organizer, and she's going to tell us what it actually means to be organized. Organization is a journey. Uh, we're going from a place to a place in my experience. And what is the most challenging thing about going from one place to another is the fact that we're going to be changing. And so organization is learning how to change our views of the things that we love, honor, and cherish, and the things that are not loved, honored, and cherished. That's what organization is in my experience. Perfect. Amy, um, can you tell us, like, uh, what does it actually mean to be organized? Excellent. That's a great question. That's a good question. Um, I think there are a lot of misconceptions about what it means to be organized. And people look at Martha Stewart and Maria Condi, and they see a very rigid system. Organization uh, is not, in my experience, anything like that. If you can find what you want to find when you want to find it, you're organized. You are reducing your stress you are saving time because you know where things are and you can get at them when you want them or you need them. So organized is a matter of gaining greater control over the environment. When you're organized, you're also safer because you have eliminated a lot of danger in your home. And to me, that is our journey to go to and from. And in order to do that, we all need to live with less. Talk to us about like the good and the bad of being organized or being disorganized. Yes, yes absolutely. Um, in order to do change in your life or in your thinking, you need to be have you need to have an open mind, and you need to be flexible. One of the things that stops people from becoming organized is that they get in a rut, they get in a box and they can't get out of it. This is the same thing as taking an exercise class and doing yoga or any other stretch. You will be more flexible and safer when your body has greater movement. It's the same thing when we organize the things that are in your home. If you are flexible and open, then you're gonna be able to make decisions. And decisions is the most difficult thing about getting organized because you're going to have to make decisions about things that either you love, honor, and cherish, or things that create guilt for you and all kinds of other emotional challenges. So the key to success is being flexible and also understanding, like a lot of things in life, you don't succeed always the first time. Nobody that I know got on a bicycle the very first time and rode all the way around the universe. It just doesn't work that way. And it's the same thing with getting organized. You need to be flexible with yourself and give yourself the opportunity not to be successful and put a system in that actually doesn't work for you and then be flexible enough to change. So we need to be flexible and open to change if we're going to be successful uh, when we want to organize. How would someone go about starting this process? Of okay, that's excellent. All right. Getting organized is the same thing as starting any other project. Whatever project you've ever done in your whole life, if you were going to do uh, a painting, you would have to get a canvas, you'd have to get the paints, you have to get the brushes, you have to get an easel. Organizing is the same thing. We have to figure out what we want to do and we have to set goals and we have to put a plan in place. And the plan in place talks about a lot of things. What are our immediate goals? What are our long range goals? How much time do we have to devote to this? How much money do we have to devote to this? So in organizing, as in any other project, we need to do planning. And again, you need to be flexible. If you put aside a certain amount of hours and that doesn't work, that's fine. Let's revisit it and see if we need more hours or less hours. Uh, talking about hours in it, I just want to talk about energy. Um, because you're making a lot of decisions when you organize things, it is very exhausting and takes a lot of energy. 
And so we want to do things in small pieces, not in large pieces. Um, you know, the expression Rome is not built in a day. You cannot organize in a day because you're changing behavior. You need to give yourself small little increments and then the big picture will appear. Ask you, Amy, is when people start to organize, it, mm -hmm. it can be overwhelming, yes. However, I'm sure that you must have some tips and tricks yep. for doing organizing. Like, where do we start? You know, is it good to start with the photographs or should we go through the old books? Or good idea. You, good question. What's your method on this? Okay. So let's talk about that. Um, there are things that trigger us emotionally, psychologically, physically. And when you sit down with an organizer and you put your goals together, this is how you're going to know where to begin. In my experience, we want to begin with the things that are least emotionally challenging. For instance, the junk drawer in your kitchen. That drawer probably has very little emotional attachment to you. The stapler, the, the broken you know, hammer that's in there. Those items have very little emotional attachment and making decisions about them are relatively easy. The good thing about starting with a junk drawer like that is that you're going to succeed. You're going to see it organized. You're going to give yourself a reward and it will give you the incentive to now go to the next level and try to comp and try to challenge yourself to another place in your kitchen. Let's talk about, for instance, what I call the holiday closet. Now that in a kitchen can be incredibly exhausting and emotionally triggering. A holiday closet for many people is where they put Christmas, Easter, Hanukkah, all their holiday stuff, and they put it in a closet. And some of it wasn't theirs. It belonged to family members. Family. It was handed down. And those items carry a large emotional story with them. That closet becomes more difficult. We don't start with a closet like that. We work our way up to that kind of a closet. I want you to imagine it as if you were learning how to ski. You start on the bunny trail and you do little ones. Then you get to the next trail. Then you get on the lift. Then you get higher. Nobody starts on a black diamond. If you do that, <laughs> if you go, ah! okay. If you do that and you start at the black diamond, you are definitely going to fail. It will just not work. So let's let's look at this like any other learning experience. Let's start at the beginning with small things like the junk drawer and work our way up to the emotionally charged Christmas, Hanukkah, Easter, Passover drawer a cabinet that holds a lot of emotions. Now you were talking about photographs. Um, that tends between not just photographs, Annette, People also have um, from their from people that pass down to them Super 8 film. They have all kinds of small little um, uh, things that you put in a carousel. I don't remember what they're called. Um, they have things that go back to the 50s. Things that they oh, don't the even know. Slides, you're talking about slides, right? Oh, slides. People have slides when their aunt and their uncle and their parents went on vacation. <laughs> it's from so long ago, I almost couldn't remember. <laughs> but they are in my lifetime. <laughs> there you go. All right. So what happens with things like photographs, and when you talk about an emotionally charged and why we don't start with that, um, that is usually a very large, individualized, huge project unto itself. And that is not something you would start with. And now that there are so many mechanical ways of saving photographs and saving movies and all of that stuff, going through all of it and identifying it, categorizing it, finding ways to save it, that in itself is a project all unto itself. And we would never start with that because, again, we're not going up to that black diamond, go down the mountain and break every bone in our body. So let's, let's not burn and crash like a phoenix. So yes, Annette, one of, the, one of the things that makes working with a professional organizer either a failure or a success is the ability to take large tasks and break them into smaller pieces so it's easier to manage both psychologically, emotionally, physically, and you're much more successful much more often. And that's what we want.
We want to see ourselves being successful. What is your suggested plan? Because, you know, it's that old adage of plan to fail, fail to plan. What might someone do if they were going to make a plan to get organized? Let's say, mm -hmm. and it's not even them specifically. Maybe it's, you know, mom or dad's house and they collected things. Correct. For 40 or 50 years. And even if they're not a hoarder, there's still lots and lots of stuff. How do they sure. go about dealing with that? I believe that everything can be done in threes. Um, in this country, it's God bless America, three strikes, you're out. It's as easy as ABC. Um, that is an easy way for us to function. Um, there's even a test where they will ask you to remember the three things. Uh, when you go to the store, get eggs, butter, and milk. Then someone asks you that a half an hour later, and if you can remember eggs, butter, and milk, means your brain is still working. And so when it comes to prioritizing things, either for ourselves or for relatives, or for friends, my suggestion always is that we prioritize things in threes. And we always use color because color motivates a lot of people. Red, yellow, and green lights, there's a reason there are three of them. So let's give an example, Annette. If you have an auntie and she has a lot, a lot of rugs all over the place that she's put down year after year when the carpet got a little bit frayed. And now she has this on the floor and that on the floor. That might be your number one priority in organization because that is a safety issue. So maybe with seniors or people who have physical challenges, one of the first things we want to organize and the first thing we want to tackle are safety issues. If a senior or someone else can't reach the cup or the glass to pour themselves a glass of water or a cup of tea because the shelf is too high, that's something we need to rearrange. So one of the first things that we do, um, which is, we, I usually put it in green because that's the one we want to go to first, mainly are issues of health and safety. Um, Often, you know, what you and I have seen um, is you open someone's refrigerator and you realize this refrigerator has not been attended to in a very long time. And it in, in itself is a health and a safety issue. So when it comes to organization, especially with those who are seniors or, or have physical challenges, um, the first thing I think we should all organize and put in green with little green stickers or ribbons or whatever is issues of safety and health. Um, I would suggest that people go and look at medicine cabinets. They are a dangerous, dangerous place that needs ex to, be, to be organized as well. Um, then let's look at the yellow, things that come after that. So let's talk about uh, someone being able, now that we're moving from summer to, to fall, you wanna be able to put on a light jacket or a sweater or a coat. If your closets are in such disarray that you actually can't transition from one season to the other, that's something that needs to be addressed. So you might make that a yellow issue, you know, and some of the very last things when you talk about trinkets and what we call stuff, people have collected, let's say, yadros, or they have collected hummels, and they've collected, I've seen huge, huge collections of thimbles. Thimbles were a very big collectible thing. I've been in many people's homes where there are hundreds of thimbles. That could be a red. We could wait till the end on that. And so again, Annette, if we can prioritize both by color and by contact, which is going to affect the person most, that might be a really good way to start setting your goals so that you can be successful. Okay, so just to recap that, green, yellow, and red, are, how are we categorizing those? Green is something that needs your immediate attention. And when I work with clients, in my experience, um, I actually bring ribbon and stickers in red, yellow, and green. And I actually put stickers on things so that we label them. You're right. Green is something that's immediate. Yellow is something that we need to attend to, like, you know, dealing with that medicine cabinet and stuff like that. Uh, and red, which is the thing at the very, very end, are all the little, you know, tchotchkes and I items that people have collected over the years. Um, let me just say one thing when it talks about priorities in it. Paper is a very big um, challenge, 
not just for seniors, but even, you know, for those of those people who are younger. Um, I do remember, I think most of you do, that we said once we got into computers, you know, we were not going to need paper anymore. Um, in my experience, that has not happened. And what I see is an enormous amount of paper. Um, I see that people do not get rid of paper. And paper is an incredibly dangerous item in the home. Um, it is a fire hazard. It is a health hazard because paper is always disintegrating and creates tiny little mites that people breathe in and people trip and fall over paper. So one of my big priorities, when you look through someone's home, whether it's someone who's older or younger, and they are talking about challenges, paper is a very, very, should be a green. It's the first thing we should work on to get that particular situation out of an environment. Okay. Okay. Does so that answer it? Yes. And that's good. So that leads me to like, what do we do with all that paper? Ah, okay. Good question. Let's talk about what do we do with all of the stuff that we go through and we decide that we're going to live with less. We don't need 14 pairs of gloves. We could live with eight. We don't need so many of this. We can live with less. So let's talk about what do we do with all of those things. Um, Let's talk about paper first, because that is a big issue. Um, often in neighborhoods, there your elected officials will have a, um, a shredding day, um, and they will send out a notice. Often um, assembly people and some of your local uh, officials will bring big trucks into a particular neighborhood, and you could bring your paper there and they'll shred it for you in the truck. So that's one way uh, that you can do it. There are also companies like Iron Mountain, Time, a whole bunch of them. And what they do is they will drop off for you, Annette, a huge bin with a cover and you just fill it with paper till you get to the tippy tippy top. You call them up. They roll that bin out of your house. They take it up on an elevator on the truck. They turn it upside down and everything gets shredded in one, one swoop. So getting rid of things like paper, there are lots of methods to do it. Donating clothes, uh, there are many, many charities that will come and pick up. Uh, make sure that you make a list so you know what you can deduct. Um, when it comes Wait, to- deduct. What are you talking about? Deduct, deduct from what? Okay, so when you are donating clothes and items to charities, um, those can be tax deductible. You should always keep a list of what you've deducted. So remember we talked about that cloak, that coat closet. So you had all those coats and now you're going to live with less and only have four winter coats. So the six winter coats that you're going to donate, you make a list of them. And the way I have seen it done in my experience, if you, per if you're donating a coat and I'm going to pick a number and let's say when you purchased it, it was $300. The donated value of it is a hundred dollars. And many charities will give you a receipt for the items that you've donated with them. And then you can present that to anyone who's preparing your taxes and see if it's a value to you. People do not all, all, want to always give things away, quote, for free. And that is a mindset. And so one of the things that I do is we try to donate and give someone a tax uh, receipt so they feel that they are somehow getting some value back. But almost everything has a place. Uh, Habitat for Humanity, if you are, you know, if you have five air conditioners that you're not using, Habitat for Humanity will come and pick them up and reuse them. So almost everything that you, that we have, um, that we decide is no longer going to be in our life, can be donated to places. There are people who will come and pick them up and we will try to get them in another place other than landfill. There is a time that things have to go in the garbage because they're broken uh, or they can't be donated like mattresses um, and things like that. But even some things that can't be donated can be donated. For instance, you cannot donate towels. That's a health law in the city of New York. Um, but if you now have really ratty, not happy, not colorful towels anymore, you can take it to your local veterinarian because those cats and dogs in there use those uh, towels, you know, and make little comfortable beds for themselves. Uh -huh. So even something that the law says you cannot donate, 
yes, you cannot donate it in one arena, but there are a lot of other arenas. We can make sure that those things that you are no longer keeping will have a significant place to go. Okay. So before I uh, give you my next question that I'm coming <laughs> up with, I'd like to let everybody know that this uh, show is sponsored by Bresri Realty. Bresri helps us to be able to do the editing of the show and all the software we need to do and just put it all together. So thank you to Bresri Realty. And just to disclose, I am the broker for Bresri Realty and hence wanting to sponsor the show even more. I have been a senior advocate uh, since the, I would say mid 2000, like 2005 or six, I started to get involved with a lot of senior organizations and uh, came up with a few different things myself to help them organize. One called Wallet Ice in case of emergency, and that's a document. Uh, basically, anybody could put together somewhat on themselves by keeping a list of their uh, prescriptions, etc., in a bag. And uh, so now we're going to go back to Amy. And Amy, you were talking about paper before. Mm -hmm. And you were talking about getting rid of paper. But mm -hmm. sometimes there are papers that we want to keep, maybe for tax right. records or something, where we don't have to necessarily have mm -hmm. the original. So what can be done about all that stuff? Like, you know, we did our taxes and everything, and now... What are we going to do? We have seven years of stuff sitting around? <laughs> well, first of all, we have to talk to the, your tax preparer, uh, whether they're an accountant, a CPA, whoever they are. Uh, and we always follow their guidelines of what to keep and what not to keep. In my experience, um, we keep the full uh, tax return and all of the supporting documents for the past three years. That is what the standard has been in my past experience. The four years previous to that, we don't usually need to keep all the backup documents, but we need to keep the tax returns. That being said, now that we have the technology to scan and either put things on a thumb drive or in, in some other storage in the cloud or wherever that is, um, <laughs> which I don't know, um, but, <laughs> Rather than physically hold on to paper, we can store a lot of that documentation in other places should you need it. However, no one should dispose of anything uh, without first consulting with your tax professional. And anything that can be disposed of should be shredded because that information should not be out in the field uh, in, a, in a bag floating around somewhere in a garbage disposal. Um, oftentimes, I will ask uh, a client to have a conversation with the person who prepared their taxes just to make sure we're doing the right things because we want to do right things right the first time. So, yes. I just want to say, Amy, we've got a couple of comments coming in from our viewers. We've got Robin Hajoti, which I want to say, go gym guys. They have an excellent uh, service and uh, she loves the talk on safety and how it makes sense and clearing things out so we could hopefully age in place, right? And then uh, we've got Alana Camarda, which I think is your daughter saying Correct. that she loves your red lipstick. Oh. And so uh, we wanna just tell the folks, if you wanna put any comments in, go ahead and uh, we'll be able to read those comments and have Amy answer some of your questions. So please Absolutely. do that. Thank you. Go ahead, so Amy. Yeah, I wanted to jump in a little bit and ask you um, if we could talk about the keys to success in organization. There are three keys that I'd like to talk about. Can we jump to that for a moment? Please do, thank you. Okay. So we started off when Annette asked about organization and I was talking about being flexible, uh, that if it doesn't always work the first time, you try it another time. If this system doesn't work, you try another system. What, that is one of the key components to be able to become organized and to stay organized. But one of the other things about organized when I talked about teacups and, and other things is if a system is going to work for you, the things that you need have to be accessible to you. You have to be able to get at them, you or anybody else. So one of the things in organization is just like a supermarket where the brands that pay the most are right at eye level where you can see them, you need to treat your items just like a supermarket. We are getting into the fall now. 
What should be in your eye level are your warmer sweaters, your longer uh, shirts, warmer socks, different shoes. These are the things that should be accessible because that's what you need for the upcoming season. Take your summer stuff, put it in the back on top where you can't get at it and you don't need it. So accessibility uh, is very key in the kitchen. If you are trying to prep correctly, one of the things in organizing is if you have an organized kitchen, you're probably eating healthier because you have pots that you can reach. Your refrigerator is organized. You can find the, the ingredients. Your knives are sharp so you can prep correctly. So accessibility, if you have it and you put it in place, will definitely help you be much more successful at organizing. And the third thing is you have to be able to see it. So I love, please don't misunderstand me, I love all the beautiful containers that people buy that are fabric and colored and all of that, and it's very, very pretty. But if you don't know what's in the container, you can't get at it and you won't be able to find it. In my experience, it is much more successful if any container that you're using has a corner, meaning it's a square or a rectangle, and that it is clear so you can see right through it and you know what's in it. So in my experience, the three things that are going to help you be most successful, either organizing yourself or helping others get organized, is that they have to be able to see what they're looking for. You have to be able to get at it so it's accessible. And if it's not working for you and you need to move things around, you need to be flexible and say, this isn't working and I need to change it. Okay, fantastic. Okay. <laughs> so we've got these clear containers and we've got things at eye level. Do we have to label these containers or anything? Or okay, so let's talk about labeling. Um, you know, I, I feel as an organizer that you can either be a Jetta or a Jaguar. Um, and both cars are going to get you from here to there. It's just what they look like and how they feel. So the reason I talk, Annette, about clear containers with corners is that there's no extra work. It's clear. It's easy. It's the Jetta. You put your stuff in it. You've got it and you can find it. If you want to do the Jaguar and do all the beautiful labels and take all the wonderful pictures, um, if you're into crafts and you want to craft it and do that, that's certainly up to you. Um, my goal as an organizer is to find the system that works best for you or the person that you're working with. If that works best for them, then let's do it. I do want to talk about labeling for one second. Um, if you open up your refrigerator, in many refrigerators, you will see drawers that are labeled and they say fruit and they say vegetable and they say cold cuts and they say butter and they are labeled. So manufacturers understand that when things are labeled, people will almost always put things in that place. And that's why they put labels there. Labels can be incredibly helpful and can also give you greater control. So for instance, in your kitchen, if you label one of the drawers when you open it and it says knives, most of the time, most people will not put spatulas and other things in with a drawer that says knives. If there is a bin that says gloves, most people will not throw their boots in there or anything else in their scarves. So labeling, um, is a great tool to keep you under control and to keep other people in control. Um, for those of us who have grandchildren or for those of you who have children, um, one of the big things that organizers help with is getting children to school every day without a lot of drama. Um, and what I have seen in my experience that works well is labeling Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, little bins. And on Sunday night, the bins get filled so everybody knows what they're wearing in the morning. And then all they do is they say, what day is today? Ah, it's Thursday. And you pull the Thursday drawer. So labeling works both 
for adults, but it's also a great tool for children. That kind of sounds like it reminded me of my constantly telling seniors they should have the little pill boxes. Correct. Because it can become very disorganizing to remember what to put in each box. And if someone else has to do it for them, at least you can tell if they took their pills that particular Correct. day. Correct. So um, um, go ahead. Let me also say that part of that process, Annette, of putting the pills in the Sunday through Saturday and Sunday through Saturday and putting that in, um, if you have a senior or someone else who's uh, who can manage to do that kind of sorting, that's one thing. But there is also a specialized um, pharmacy where they will create individual packets and the packets themselves have all the four or five pills that people need. And mm -hmm. each little individual packet will say Sunday, Monday, two, and it will be dated. And yes. then no one has to sort anything. No one has to touch anything. All they do is pull it off, open it up, and swallow it. So depending again uh, on the need of the person who needs to get organized, we do have a lot of options um, and we should avail ourselves of whatever options we can we can get to. Exactly. To That's a very good point. Yes. Thank you for bringing that up. You're welcome. Another thing to note on that is that sometimes people will have medications that change. So there may be a concern like what if it changes Right. And then they're going to start to pull them out as needed. Maybe they had to take a pill out or mm -hmm. they had to get one more new pill. And a person right, right. might not remember to take that package. So those can actually be sent back to the pharmacy. And at no charge, they will repackage them for you. They will take sometimes a few days to get that done, but it can be done. So thanks for Correct. bringing that up. Amy. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, we just, we just need to figure out what is going to be safest, what's going to be healthiest, uh, what's going to work best. And that's what we try to do. And if it doesn't, we change and we go to something else. So let me ask, in being organized, do you ever recommend to your clients that they have a go bag in case of emergency? We do. We have a couple of go bags. In fact, I'm glad that you uh, that you said that. Um, one of the things that I uh, help my uh, seniors and even people who are not seniors, but who have a lot of medical challenges um, is we create the red envelope um, I buy the red envelopes from Christmas time, big red envelopes, um, and I would put my name on it. Let's say it, I was making it for myself and it says Amy Schoenfeld and it would have my birthday on it. And in that envelope, we have the name of the, uh, the physician, uh, who, um, where that physician is and how to reach them, the hospital, who is the uh, person, ICE. The, in case of emergency, who should be contacted, what medications they're taking. And we put all of that vital inf information in this big Christmas red envelope. And then we scotch tape it to the back of the front door. Because what I have seen in my experience, should paramedics be called to someone's residence, one of the things they will look for is information on the back of the door the front door. So we try to make sure that that information is there. We, we try to keep it updated um, so that the, it is visible to anyone who needs to see it. If putting it on the door doesn't work and you want to put it in the hallway, you know, as you're coming in or where the lock is by the front door, um, in a place where somebody can find it. Uh, the other thing is to reproduce that. And like you said, Annette, to carry it with them wherever they go so they can make it much smaller to have all of that vital information okay. as well as well one of the things that should also be by the front door if you have a closet or a niche or something is a fireproof box um, for documents um, if there is a horrendous fire um, the fire department will if you if it's by the front door pick up that fire box and take it out for you and in that fire box, you might have your passport, um, the deed to the house, or any paperwork that would be just so horrendous to have to reproduce, if, if we could reproduce it at all. Your birth certificate, your social security card, you put it in a, lock, in a fire box and lock it. Now, this is not the box where you put your diamonds, your pearls, your emeralds. This is not that place that you put in another place. This is... <laughs> This is paperwork that's essential for you 
and that a fireman would pick up and take out of the house. So the other thing that we do organize is essential papers in a firebox, and you'll know the difference. It's a big, fat, thick box, and it's very crazy heavy, and I would put that by the front door as well. Does that answer? It sure does. So we're coming, we're coming to you folks from Brooklyn, New York, and this is Amy, the expert organizer. And Amy also uh, goes out to people's homes. That is her specialty. Mm -hmm. And she helps them to get all this stuff organized. So I know for seniors, and most of my clients are seniors, that organizing is an extremely overwhelming task, mm -hmm. uh, physically, mentally, emotionally. Those, you know, there's those three triggers, right? Absolutely. And, uh, we want to be able to alleviate that for you. So Amy, if you could give us a number that uh, people could get in touch with you on in case they need your sure. services, sure. please feel free. So my cell phone number is 917-903-8769. 917-903-8769. Okay, great. We still have a few more things to Talk uh, tell you all about. However, uh, for those of you watching, and this is maybe your first time watching virtual because we have invited many senior clients, et cetera, to come and see the show, know that you can see it again just by going back to PESID Senior Resources on YouTube, and you have to hit the live tab. And also, when you're uh, viewing our channel, if you could subscribe, you will get notices in the future of shows that are coming up. And in addition to that, if you like our channel, you hit the little like button there, and then that helps us to get more people uh, telling us that it's good or making comments even uh, in the comments section is important. You can tell us future shows that you might want to see. And so we're here for you. Uh, that's the purpose of PESID, People Empowering Seniors, Independence and Dignity, is to help you with the things that you need questions, uh, answers to on your questions. So Amy, back to you. If you yep. could tell us a little bit about some key documents that people should be keeping okay. and maybe how they could organize all of that. Okay, so let's talk about key documents. Um, one of the biggest challenges is locating a document and making sure that someone else can locate a document. One of the keys to organization is not only that you can find the document, but you can tell someone else where to find the document. So um, I have prepared and I have a list that I work with. Um, it is a checklist. And what you do is you, for instance, I'm going to give you the top three. Who is the physician? We put in the physician's name and the phone number. Who is your accountant or your tax person and the phone number? We put in all of these reach people so that should these people have to be spoken to either by an executor or by your children or by your spouse, they will know where everything is. Not knowing where documents are is when we start to see a lot of trouble. For instance, I just had a situation where someone passed away and nobody knew which cemetery that the graves were in and where they were in the cemetery. And that is an incredibly stressful situation that can be very easily avoidable if you have already purchased a plot or you have a family plot or whatever it is. There should be a document that says, you know, we have a family plot. This is where it is. This is how to get to it. This is how it's put in charge. And again, Annette, because it's 2023, that document can be a physical document in that firebox. It could also be kept online uh, and in the cloud or wherever. Um, it can be given to your um, attorney who is handling your estate or an attorney with whom you work or a guardian or a child or anyone who will who would be able to find those documents should you need them. It is critical to get those documents in a place where people can find them, even if it's in, let's say, a safe deposit box. As long as someone knows where it is and they know where the key is and they've been signed into your box, as long as you put that in place, 
That is keeping everything under control. So everything will move smoothly when we need to find documents. Okay, perfect. So is there anything else that you might want to impart to us, Amy, so that we can manage to get this overwhelming task <laughs> in order, especially before the holidays are coming? Okay. Um, what might we look out for when we go to a senior's home, let's say, Correct. Uh, and realize maybe should be corrected before something catastrophic happens, like taking a fall that they may not recover from? Okay. Um, you know, during the holidays, um, it depends upon what I have seen in my experience, whether you are celebrating the holiday in that particular environment, or you're picking that person up and bringing them to your environment. Um, there are two key things for safety. Uh, they need to be kept safe in their environment, but you also need to make sure that your environment is safe for them as well. Um, those of us who are younger might have those big, beautiful area rugs with fringes on it and all that type of stuff. And that is a danger. That is a potential danger to someone who's using a walker. So one of the things that we want to talk about before the holidays um, is making sure that if we are bringing seniors into our environment, that our environment is safe for them. Same thing with the chair that they're sitting in. You know, oftentimes, because they are not, their balance is off, they probably need a larger chair or a heavier chair, or they need a different kind of a chair than the chair that you're sitting in. So um, that's one of the things about holidays and getting ready for holidays is not just the shopping and the cooking and the decorating, but ensuring that their space is safe and your space is safe. Now, seniors who want to do a lot of Christmas decorating or Hanukkah decorating or uh, Kwanzaa decorating, uh, oftentimes um, that stuff has been sitting out there all year and they've ne never put it away. And that is an indication uh, that we're having a challenge. Okay. When, when it's Christmas for 12 months, it tells you, <laughs> it tells you that this person is having a challenge putting it away getting it out of their space and moving on to the next season. So sometimes holidays and their, and their accruements are a real um, eye way, opener to us as to the state of that person and the way they are managing or not managing their house. The challenge also with that, Annette, is if all of those items are always out, they are accumulating an enormous amount of dust and dirt. And that senior is breathing in all of that dust and dirt as we turn on the air conditioner, the fan, the heater, the air conditioner, the fan as we go through seasons. And we have now cre helped create a very unhealthy environment for them. They cannot, nobody can clean that. They can't clean it either. So one of the challenges with holiday decorations and other items is that they themselves create their own health challenges for seniors and, and others as well. Okay. And it's an indication that we need to pay attention uh, when we go into someone's house and we have 100 Easter bunnies and Easter baskets and all that stuff still sitting there. And it's now September. So let me ask you. So like if a senior is sitting at a dinner table with folks and a lot of times there's, you know, the two chairs at the head of the table and they have arms on them and all the other side chairs tend not to have arms, I right. guess you're saying is not just about where they sit in general, but even at the table, maybe have arms because Correct. maybe they might, you know, decide to bend over and they, like you say, lose their balance. They lose their balance. Yeah. Robin at Jim guys, our good friend. Um, and hopefully we'll have her coming on one of the uh, future yeah. episodes. So for those of you who are not familiar, we're going to be doing these interviews every Thursday at three o'clock. So you could look at, for us on this same channel, Pesset Senior Resources, 3 p.m. And like I said, if you subscribe and then you hit the button again, so it shows like the little symbol of a bell vibrating, it will actually give you a notification that the show is coming up once I announce it. And I usually don't announce it more than a week out. Um, because we do have a show every week and that would become very confusing. So Amy, are there any last uh, points that you'd like to there give? Is. I want to leave you with a, with, with a trick um, that I have found has been incredible, incredibly useful. Making a decision about your clothes and other people's clothes uh, oftentimes has a lot of overlay. Uh, you bought an outfit 
Uh, you never really wore it or you only wore it once. It was very expensive and you have a lot of guilt or you bought too many of a particular item and they're hanging in your closet. Here's, here's my tip for you as we now transition out of summer and into fall. When you transition your clothes into the closet for the coolest season, put all of your hangers on the rod backwards. So instead of putting your hanger correctly over the rod, you're going to do it backwards so it's facing you. Everything, all your hangers now will be facing you, which is very, very crazy. But as we go through September, October, November, December, and we wear our clothes, we're going to turn the hanger around because that, that makes sense. I'm wearing that outfit. I'm going to turn it around. I wore this outfit. I turn it around. I wore that coat. I turn it around. But guess what? In April, when we start to get ready for the warmer weather, and there are still items on hangers that are backwards. You don't have to make any decisions. You don't even have to think about it. The hanger has made the decision for you that that coat or that dress or that shirt no longer served you. You didn't wear it a whole season. Just take that hanger and that item and let's give it away to someone who doesn't have a sweater, who doesn't have a dress, who probably could use a coat and that will help you in decision making. And that is my hanger tip. So this is day. actually the perfect time of year for that because now we're changing over from summer to fall winter Correct. clothes. So I have to run and turn everything in my closet around because I'm sure I have plenty of stuff I should part with, but I'm always like, oh no, I'm going to wear this or that or whatever. And I'm almost thinking like, okay, even if I'm not willing to part after a year, maybe I bag them up separately after I see that. So when I bring them out again, Maybe I could put some kind of colored hangers so I know those were the old ones. You know, we could really get crazy. And so for those of us who just refuse to give up our stuff, <laughs> then we would know, okay, now I not only pass one season, but now I'm going to go to two seasons. Correct. I better get rid of that stuff. Because folks, here in New York, you're talking on the low end, $400 a square foot for real estate. And why are we taking up our real estate with stuff that we just don't use, right? Just to get another closet, you know, is going to cost you several thousand dollars, let's say, to have a closet built. And then you have to have the space to put it in. So Correct. that junk in our spaces and we got to get it out. And what's some of the other benefits of like getting this stuff out, Amy? Is it just about organizing and having a clear yeah, Absolutely mind. not. When, when you are living with less, you have greater access to actually what's in your home. You can keep it cleaner and it is healthier to live with less because you can pay attention to the floor, to the surfaces, to the items that you're wearing. It is much safer. It is less stressful. Uh, you will have more time to cook healthier, to live healthier, um, to spend more time with family and do the things that you want because you're not spending your time maintaining, looking for all kinds of items that you no longer love, honor, or cherish. And that is one of the three deciding things. Remember I told you everything in threes. You put your hand on an item and you say, do I love, honor, and cherish this? And if you can't answer that question as yes, 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 Mm -hmm. you say, bye, oh, we got to have a yes to all three. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I honor it. I cherish it. <laughs> let, okay. let me just say one other thing, Annette, about sure. helping people make decisions. You know, shoes are a big trigger for many people. And now everyone owns 465,000 pairs of sneakers for which oh, they pay. Again. There we go. Here's, here's how you're going to do the same thing with your sneakers. You're going to go to a dollar store and buy a box of um, fabric softener sheets in something like linen. They have a thing called white linen. That's the scent. And uh -huh. you're going to put those dryer sheets in every pair of shoes and boots and everything that you own. And at the end of the season, if you are now moving your stuff from one season to another and it still has a dryer sheet in that shoe, guess what? Got to get rid of it. You got it. <laughs> Sayonara. You don't have to make any decisions. The dryer sheet will make the decision for you. Got it.
All right. So if you want to find out more information about Amy, you can also find her website. It is now listed in the description area. So if you're not too familiar with how YouTube works, when you're looking at a video, there's usually the title and then below the title, you'll see a description. And many times you'll see something that says more. And so you click on that more tab. And when you do, and you scroll down, you're going to find Amy's website, which is the expert organizer.com. Yeah. And Amy is located here in New York. And you want to tell us what areas of New York you actually work in? Uh, actually, um, I work in every area of New York. I do Brooklyn, Queens. I do the five boroughs. I do Long Island. Um, I've actually been flown to Miami. Um, I'm, I've actually been <laughs> flown to places to help people pack and unpack and do things. So I go where, every, where everyone needs me. So okay. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm everywhere. Okay. So we thank you for having you here today on our show, you, Amy. Annette. You were a terrific asset to uh, Pesset Senior Resources, and we hope everyone gets organized and gets ready for the holidays. You know, they're already upon us. We did start out already with some Jewish holidays, but now we'll get into many of the others, and it'll be important for you to get everything together and you'll feel so much better and it may be a lot easier for you to do using some of these tips. So Thank you so much. So this show, uh, like I said, is uh, PESID, uh, Senior Resources, and uh, you can join us if you want to uh, be part of our networking group. There is a free PESID membership and all you have to do is go to PESID.com and that's as you see on the little sign on my shelf there, P-E-S-I-D, and sign up there for the free membership. We also have a group on Facebook, and we have another group that is on LinkedIn. So there are several ways that you could actually reach out to us. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Again, this show was sponsored by Bresri Realty. I do work for Bresri. I am the broker at Bresri. And if you'd like to get a free value on what your home is currently worth, you can give me a call and I'd be happy to put that report together for you. You do have to be the owner of the home. I thank you so much for being with us today. And I thank you, Amy, again. My for pleasure to share with you. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Take care. And Take care. Power our seniors so they have independence and dignity. That's what PESIT is all about. Okay, take care, everyone. Thanks, Thank everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.